Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's lovely to see you here this morning. Thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, just a, a note, one notice to give this week, and just say thank you uh, for those of you who brought food last week for our fellowship lunch. We had a lovely time together afterwards, and thank you to all of those who provided some fabulous food for us uh, last Sunday morning. If you have a Bible, will you turn with me, please, to Psalm 67? We're going to begin by reading, I'll read this psalm, and then that will lead us into our first song this morning. Psalm 67 is uh, for the director of music uh, with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song, and it's a psalm that has a couple of those words, sila, to make us pause and think. And that's a good thing to do, isn't it, as we gather together this morning, to just take a breath, calm our hearts and minds, pause and think upon the Lord. Psalm 67, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, sila. That your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among the nations. May all the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. Selah. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. What great things to set our hearts upon this morning. Let us think about how God will be gracious to us today and bless us as we come to praise him. May all the peoples praise him. We gather together, not only with each other this morning, but with brothers and sisters in Christ around the world as we gather together on this Sunday morning to praise God. And we can praise him for his goodness and his grace to us for his wonderful salvation. That's what we're going to do as we stand and sing our first song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's stand as we sing together. The words will be on the screen. Say 
please take a seat. Well, let's come to our great God as we pray together. Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence this morning to praise you, O God. All of the peoples, all of the nations gather to praise you this day, for you are good and gracious. You are loving and kind. And thank you that we come in the name of Jesus Christ. It's in Christ alone, our cornerstone, that we find our salvation. Father, thank you that Jesus, the light of the world, came into the darkness. Thank you that Jesus has brought us from death to life, that in him we find our salvation. In him we find life in all its fullness. Father, thank you that we can look back to the cross and the resurrection with great joy and thanksgiving this morning. Thank you that we can look forward to that day when he will come again with trumpet sound. Lord, we pray that we will be found in Christ upon that day. Father, we pray that uh, we will be walking in step with the Spirit, closely with you, longing for, looking for that day. Lord, until that day, would you keep us in your grace? In days that seem dark or difficult, in the middle of storms of life, Lord, may we wholly and wholeheartedly hold on to you. Lord, for this day we pray, would you be gracious to us and bless us? Would you make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, we are talking about sorrow to joy this morning. So I'm picking up on what John's going to speak to us um, in a moment. I'm just giving you a little sneak preview. Um, so sorrow to joy, sad times to wonderful times. Let's have the first slide please Richard. So this is World War, World War I. I, yeah, World War I. And World War I claimed over 60 million lives, including civilians and soldiers. A terrible, terrible time um, for many. And it was, I suppose, when people went through it, something that they thought no good could come of. But actually, there was some good that came of World War I. It brought about the movement of the suffragettes, and it was um, instrumental in getting a People Act in 1918, which granted um, votes for women over 30 who were householders or the wives of householders or graduates. So something good that came out of something very, very sad and um, terrible. And Esther has been a book very much about that, so I know you've been going through it. Um, and we got to chapter 10 now, and we see finally something to celebrate. Now, I wonder what you celebrate. Um, on, no, on Thursday, ben, was it Thursday or Friday you ran? Thursday, Friday. Benjamin ran nine and a half miles wow. and so we were celebrating yeah so his teacher ran from wilden to risley and the school ran around the field um in sort of um solid solid solidarity with him and yeah benjamin got the most in his class didn't you he did really really well so when we got home i was so pleased we celebrated didn't we we had an ice lolly <laughs> it was the pinnacle of celebrating. We had a nice lot, didn't we? And I put some money in your jar for your Lego saving. Um, so we celebrate when we win something, or it's a birthday, or maybe it's Christmas, maybe someone in the family has a special event, they get married, and we celebrate, and it's good times, isn't it? So next slide, please. Um, so we've got to this point in Esther where God's people had been in grave, grave danger and they were waiting to die. It was the most terrible time. I can't imagine what it would be like to know that one day the, your people, all your people were going to die. So they had good reason to be sorrowful, but something came out of their um, sorry, uh, suffering and their sorrow. It was turned into joy. Instead of them being put to death, Esther and Mordecai were in the right place at the right time and they were good examples of waiting for the Lord in terrible times. 
Now it might be that God puts us in terrible times. It might be that you're going through a terrible time right now. But God does put us in the right place at the right time to point to him. And I'm sure Esther and Mordecai had an eternal view, which is what we've just been singing about, what John's been praying about, when um, we can look forward to the good stuff that God has got prepared for us. So, you may have noticed me wandering around with this piece of string. It's very long. It goes all the way around this room and all the way out the door forever. So just imagine that this is your life. It's going to go on forever and ever and ever. It's all the way around the room, all the way out the door, forever. Imagine that this is your life. And actually, this red part, right at the beginning, is your time on earth. So in comparison to the rest of eternity, this time on earth is very, very short, isn't it? And God says, even if we're going through tough times, remember all the good times you've got to look forward to with me in eternity. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that in terrible times we can look to you and we can trust you. We can know that we have got eternity to look forward to because of Jesus, because of what he did for us on the cross. And so we ask that you would help us to trust Jesus and his work on the cross and his resurrection when we're going through these hard and difficult times, help us to trust that and to look forward to eternity with Jesus as King of Kings. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Sam. We're going to sing again, and we're going to sing of a God who is a holy God. We're going to see that in our passage today. And this song's really helpful for us because at the last verse, it reminds us that who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only a holy God. And it's the wonder and joy of the gospel that through Jesus the son, we get to call God our father, even though he is also this awesome holy God. He's our father in heaven, with whom one day we'll spend all, all of eternity. So let's stand and give him glory as we sing together, uh, Who Else Commands the Host of Heaven?
take a seat. Well, before Jeanette comes to read us uh, those last two chapters of Esther, Rich is going to come first and lead us in our prayers this morning. Thank you, Rich. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we praise and thank you that you are a God of deliverance. We thank you that you sent the Lord Jesus Christ to pay the price of sin and defeat the evil one through his death on the cross and his resurrection. We thank you for the life that comes from being united with Christ, and we look forward to the day when you raise us up to be with him, that we might praise you forevermore. We thank you, Father, that when we fall into sin, you forgive us and restore us. How much better that we would resist the temptation, and therefore we ask that you would lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <clears throat> May we know the power of the risen Christ at work in our hearts as we seek your strength in dealing with all the, the trials we face in our lives. We ask that you would not be slow to respond in prayer, but that we would know and trust in your perfect timing and grow in, in faith and patience as we wait to see your hand at work. We thank you, Father God, for the beauty of your creation and for this weather that allows us to be outside and enjoy it. However, we know that the resources of the world have been squandered and this contributes to the climate crisis facing us all. And we confess, Father, that our sin has contributed to this and we ask for your forgiveness and look forward to when you will bring the new heaven and new earth. And while many seek to protest or create technolo technological solutions to, to address climate change. We know that only you have the power to deliver us from catastrophe. And we therefore pray that people would see the futility of their own efforts and turn instead to you in repentance. And may we, your, your children, be good stewards of your created world. And may we live in such a way that causes non-believers to turn to you. And using the prayer in the, in the notice sheet, we pray for Ukraine. Almighty God, we pray for the situation in, in Ukraine. We pr pray for those who live in fear that you may grant them peace. We pray too for those who have lost their homes and livelihoods in the flooding, that you might grant them hope and relief. For our Christian brothers and sisters, we ask that you would hold them fast and grant them faith to persevere and give them the knowledge of your love for them. We pray that the voices for discernment and peaceful solutions may prosper. Lord, we ask that you raise up peacemakers on all sides and that war and violence might end. Give diplomats wisdom, understanding and build trust. We ask for the church in the nations involved. May they be salt and light in this dark situation. Lord, we lift this dangerous situation to you, and may your kingdom come. Father God, we take the chance this morning to give you thanks for the life and service of Tim Ford, former minister of this church. We pray for his wife, Jan, and their children, and ask that you will comfort them at this time. We take the opportunity to thank you for our church family, and for those who obeyed your calling to establish it here, in Sharnbrook. We thank you for all the work that has gone on before and ask that we too would be faithful in hearing and obeying your voice to further build your church for future generations. May you, may you unite us in Christ and hold us faithful to your word. May we be salt and light to our neighbours in Sharnbrook and the surrounding villages. And Father, we thank you for the work of Impact, the Bedford Area Schools Christian Support Trust. And we thank you that Impact are able to go into schools and minister to children and young people. And we ask that through their work, many children and young people would encounter the Lord Jesus through the preaching of the word. And that you will have a harvest to add to your kingdom. We thank you for the recent work in Elstow and the joyful update we have re received from the team. We also pray for the schools in Sharnbrook and the surrounding villages and ask that they too would be places receptive to your word. 
and we pray that you would help Christian staff, members and students to be salt and light in these schools and that you would draw to yourself more people to be saved. Father, we pray for Bernard, whose operation has been postponed. We ask that you would bless him and Alison as they wait for the day of the operation. And we ask this too for all those in, in the church and in our families and those we know waiting for appointments or operations or treatment. We pray for your blessing upon them. Father, for all these things we pray uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus, but for the sake of your glory. Amen. Amen. So our reading is Esther chapters 9 and 10 and it's page 507 of the Blue Church Bible. So Esther chapter 9, Triumph of the Jews. On the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. No one could stand against them, because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the king, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Harshandatha, Dalphon, Aspartha, Paratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Tarmashta, Arasai, Aridai, and Vaisatha, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The number of those slain in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, Give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on gallows. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they hanged the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa three hundred men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. Purim celebrated. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observed the 14th of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote to them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted, plotted against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast the pur, that is, the lot, 
but their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, these days were called Purim, from the word pure. Because of everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of them die out among their descendants. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihel, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Xerxes, words of goodwill and assurance to establish these days of Purim at their designated times, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores, and all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, to which the king had raised him, are they all not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews, because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. Thank you so much, Jeanette, for reading those chapters for us, and Richard for leading us in our prayers this morning. Keep your Bibles open. We're going to be uh, diving into those two chapters in just a moment. Before we do so, we're going to be, well, today is, we're going to be thinking about remembering, but also celebrating. And so that's what we're going to do with this song. It's going to celebrate, celebrate the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? Let's stand and celebrate and praise him as we sing this together.
Turn back in your Bibles, will you, to Esther chapters 9 and 10, as we think this morning about God's deliverance and the celebration of that. I don't know if you saw in the news last Monday, uh, D-Day veterans returned to France to mark the 79th anniversary of the Normandy landings. Once upon a time, that band of brothers numbered 150,000, and yet on Monday, only 15 of them were fit and able enough to return to the British Normandy Memorial in Versumeur. If you haven't seen it, the British Normandy Memorial opened a couple of years ago, and it records the name of the 22,442 servicemen and women uh, who fell not only on D-Day, but also during the Battle of Normandy in 1944. Uh, their numbers are small now, aren't they? Uh, but their stories still have a big impact. One of them, Ken Hay, is 97. Uh, lives in Upminster in Essex. He told his moving story. He was an 18-year-old private of the 4th Dorset Regiment. And he came ashore on Juno Beach a little bit later on, on June the 23rd as part of a push to get into occupied France. And he recalls this account one night. He says, all hell broke loose. Lying in the dark, watching the tracer bullets of the enemy guns, I said two prayers. The first, Lord save me. The other, if a bullet does get me, then please let it be quick. Nine of his comrades were killed. Sixteen of them managed to escape, including Ken. Another man, Don, who now lives in Basildon in Essex, recalls the Canadian soldiers who landed first. He said they got it really bad. I can remember so many of the faces of the men who died that day. The sounds of the rockets and the shells. Every detail of what happened is still there. We must never forget that. And it's really important, isn't it, that we mark those uh, centenaries and celebrations because they're celebrating the 79th anniversary because they didn't want to wait till the 80th because they don't know how many of them will be around this time next year. 
We remember so that we do not forget those heroes of war. We remember so that we don't forget the horrors of war. And as we remember, we also celebrate. We celebrate with thankfulness, don't we? The freedom that you and I enjoy today because of the sacrifice of these people and the stories that Ken and Don are able to recall. Remembering. Remembering the faces of those who died alongside them. Remembering the, the sounds and everything as if it were just yesterday. Well, today in our passage in in Esther 9 and 10, we see the establishment of Purim, an annual reminder of God's deliverance of his people in the time of Esther. If you look to chapter 9 and verses 26 and 27, uh, these words were read to us earlier. Therefore, these days were called Purim from the word pure, because everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who join them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. And for the last two and a half thousand years, they've been doing exactly that. Even, Even during the dark days of the Holocaust, the Jews still remembered this story of Esther 9 and 10 and celebrated Purim. There's one account from a German concentration camp of Gross Rosen, records this on Purim Eve. Suddenly, one of us leapt down from his small space on the bunk and began an impassioned speech that will forever remain in my memory. My fellow Jews, he called out, dear brothers in suffering, today is our Purim, when we remember the miracles God did for our ancestors. He who dwells in heaven saved our nation from being decimated. The enemy fell into a pit that he himself had dug. Today, we once again have a double-edged sword pressed against our necks. Our enemies are trying to destroy us, but do not allow terror into your hearts. The Haman of our day, Hitler and his lackeys, will not be able to overcome God's chosen nation. The eternity of Israel will not lie. The bells of freedom are already ringing in the distance. We will yet live to see justice meted out against our enemies, just like our ancestors of Shuzan of old. Be strong, brothers. The Jewish nation lives on. Quite remarkable, isn't it, that even in those darkest days of the Holocaust, these days of Purim, of what are recorded in front of us in Esther 9 and 10, were were remembered, were celebrated. And as you and I come to these last two chapters of Esther this morning, the plot has already been resolved. In fact, as we've read through Esther, I wonder if you notice we we could have ended Esther with chapter 8. You might say, well, why do we even have chapters 9 and 10? Because at the end of chapter 8, there was, everything was resolved, wasn't it? You know, they weren't going to die anymore. There was great celebration. And chapter 8 ended with those words in verse 17, in every province, in every city, wherever the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews, feasting and celebration, and many people of other nationalities became Jews because of fear of the Jews had seized them. Now, if you're writing Esther, you could have ended there and gone, and they all lived happily ever after. It's great. Why, then, do they go on to give us the gruesome detail of chapters 9 and 10? Well, we're going to see three things this morning. They're on your sermon handout sheet. We're going to see God's righteous judgment against his enemies as God's deliverance is complete. And this is really important because actually we might want it to end at chapter 8 because we're a little bit sensitive towards this. But we need to show, God needs to show that his his deliverance of his people is completed. It follows through. He doesn't want us to end on the cliffhanger of sort of like, well, it'll all end happily ever after. As if Esther's been a bit of a fairy tale and you can work out the ending of, of how it all ended. You know, a bit like... A bit like the end of the Italian job, isn't it? The bus is hanging over the... You know, what's going to happen? Are they going to survive? Are they going to go over the edge of the cliff? And the film ends, and you, you've got to make up your own ending. That would be the, the effect if Esther 8 ended there. Now, actually, we need to see God's deliverance. His judgment against his enemies will be completed. It's no fairy tale, Esther. And God's enemies must face justice. But we're also going to see, then, God's, God's deliverance celebrated. And then chapter 10 really concludes it with Queen Esther and cousin Mordecai in these positions of authority. So we're going to see God's deliverance completed, celebrated, and concluded. 
So look then, first of all, in chapter 9, the first 17 verses, God's deliverance is completed. As chapter 9 rolls on, you and I are meant to be celebrating, rejoicing. God has come through for his people. They're going to be rescued. They're, they've been under this unjust threat of death, but they're now going to be rescued. So we read in verse 1, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, this is the date they've been dreading in their calendar. The edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. We find out in verse 2, no one could stand against God's people. Isn't that what Haman's family had already told him? You know, if God is with them, you, you haven't got a hope. You're not going to stand against God. Well, they struck down their enemies. No, they're not initiating the attacks. They're allowed to defend themselves of those coming against them. There are no innocent casualties here. A rescue's been decreed. It's now inactive. It's accomplished. God's deliverance is completed. What does God think of this? All this bloodshed and destruction. Well, listen to Ezekiel 33. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. God's enemies, the enemies of the Jews, had, had had about nine months to change their mind. After that second edict's gone out, they've got the time to go, well, do you know what? We can weigh up in the balance, and I think I'm going to change my mind here. I'm going to decide not to attack God's people. And as we read chapter 9, that's what we see many of them doing. But there's a hardcore group of people who are so hardened against God and his people that they refuse to change. God's deliverance is therefore completed on them. He is just and fair, and his enemies will not get away with their sinful actions. The survival of God's people had been at stake, but God had, had intervened so that they wouldn't be destroyed, but instead would be rescued. Verses 3 and 5 are very thorough and decisive, aren't they? Verse 3, all the nobles of the provinces, satraps, governors, kings, administrators, they helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. They, they changed their minds. But verse 5, the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. So those who come to attack them, they are very thorough and decisive. We read later on, verse 16, there's about... 75,000 people who died. Now put that in context. It's estimated that in the current war in Ukraine, uh, Russia have lost about 40,000 soldiers. And the Ukrainians in defending themselves have lost about 20,000 soldiers. Actually, the 75,000 is quite a small percentage of the, the overall province, 127 provinces of King Xerxes' rule and reign. God's people here aren't initiating the hostility, they're defending themselves. And remember who they're defending themselves against, we're told. We're reminded that Haman is an Agagite. He's the one who's held this ancient grudge against God's people. Remember, as soon as he saw Mordecai, he hated him. Not because of anything necessarily he had done, just because of that ancient hostility against God and his people. And Haman's sons would no doubt carry on their father's work. That's why they're specifically mentioned here in these verses. And the ten sons of Haman would destroy because... They would carry on their father's work, given an opportunity. God acts to deliver his people. God acts in ultimate judgment of those who sinfully respond to try and kill his people. I think the response of King Xerxes is quite surprising. Uh, because in verse 12, we're told that he says to the queen, uh, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the provinces? What is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? It will be granted. You might expect him to be a little bit angry and annoyed. You've killed a load of my people. But no, he sees the injustice of what is going on and they're allowed to defend themselves. What does Esther ask in verse 13? Well, if it pleases the king, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on gallows. Oh, what's Esther doing there? This is nice, pretty Queen Esther in all her royal robes. What? What sort of a, has she become vengeful and spiteful all of a sudden? Wants to cause a bit more pain, let's give us another day to have at it. No, she knows that if those 
final 300 people are not removed, then they will take every opportunity to come and destroy God's people. She knows if Haman's sons aren't hanged on those gallows after they've been killed, it won't serve as a warning to the rest to say, look, look what God is doing in delivering his people. It's a public warning that God will not stand against what people are doing against his people. Her request is resolving the enmity between those who hate God's people and God's people. But three times in this first part we read the, the strange account that they, they do not lay their hands on the plunder. I don't know if you remember, but back in chapter 8, they were allowed to do that. But in, in verse 10 and verse 15 and verse 16, or well, look at verse 15, the Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Adar. They put to death 300 men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews, verse 16, who were in the king's provinces, also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. Why are they doing that? Well, they're not wanting to make the same mistake that Saul's made all those years ago back in 1 Samuel 15 that's almost started this whole thing when, when he spared the king's life and, and he gets the plunder in. And, and when Samuel turns up to Saul, he, he has that lovely moment with him where he kind of goes, hold on a minute, what's that bleating I hear? Have you gone and plundered their stuff when you've been told not to? And Saul's like, yeah, but well, you know, we, we just got the best of it really, didn't we? No, 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 you were told not to. And they're now not repeating the same area where Saul had been disobedient. They've been given permission to do that. They'd also been given permission, interestingly, to kill not only the, the, the fighting men, but also the women and children. And they, they restrained from doing that because we're told it's the, the 500 fighting men, 10 of Haman's sons. But they showed mercy and compassion, not going further than they needed to. Remember, they are protecting themselves not going above and beyond. I guess we see an illustration of this, don't we, in the, the war in Ukraine in front of us right now. The, the soldiers fighting on the battlefield, they're fighting the war, but when someone goes and, and, and throws a bomb onto a, a civilian tower block, you go, what are they doing? What are they doing? They're going beyond the, the, the war that's happening there between those two nations. Well, here God's people act with restraint. They show compassion and mercy. Even in the midst of, of all that bloodshed, there is mercy as they defend themselves, and God's deliverance is completed. We see that mercy in the Lord Jesus. Jesus, hanging on the cross, cries out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. The mercy and compassion of the Lord Jesus, even as he completes the deliverance of us, God's people. So God's deliverance is completed, but then we read, and this is really the main part of it, isn't it? The celebration. Uh, verses 18 and 19 remind us that the Jews in Susa had assembled on the 13th and 14th days. Then on the 15th, they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. So they, they set a date, don't they? They say, right, this is the date. We're going to remember it and it's going to be feasting and joy, isn't it? Uh, we remember, as we thought about wars and, and, and that, we, we set the date of the 11th of November so that we remember each year. That is Remembrance Day. And we remember that day because we want to remember those heroes, but we also want to remember the horrors of war. We want to celebrate freedom with thanksgiving. But what's interesting about our celebrations is that if you go around war memorials, the one in Chambre, the one in Felmersham, the one in villages around, they're in all our villages, aren't they? You get the names of people who've died during the, the First World War and the different battlefields and places perhaps they died on. And then you get added to it the Second World War, and again, the different places and times where they, they fought and fell. And they're all sort of different people, different dates. I, I think Purim's a bit more like the war memorials in Kosovo. You go to Kosovo, and, and the war memorials are more modern, because obviously it was only 20, plus, 20 or so years ago, and great big marble, and, and you'll get all the list of the names of the men and the women and the children of that village. But the striking difference is there's one date. The date the massacre came to that village. And the, the memorial will be, this is the day that the, the forces of Serbia came through, and this is the day that this town fell, and it's the one day for that town. Rather than our memorials that have all those different dates, one date. And that's the power of this date of Purim. They're going, we've got this one date to remember. This was the day when we were going to be annihilated, destroyed. But God's rescued us, so we celebrate. And we celebrate with feasting and with joy. It's a great way to end the book because it's the way the book began. 
that began with feasting, but the king had his own look at me type celebration until he got rid of Queen Vashti. Now it is celebrate with joy and thank God for his faithfulness and his deliverance, his mercy to his people. Again, their celebration is different to ours because look what happens in theirs, uh, verse uh, 22. They celebrate this time when the Jews got relief from their enemies. Uh, he wrote to them to observe days of feasting and joy, giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So you see how their celebration falls over into to joy and doing good. Again, that's a real contrast from ours, isn't it? So we, we remember, remember the 5th of November, don't we? Gunpowder, treason and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder, treason should ever be forgot. And what do we do? We get a bonfire and if health and safety allows, we get a guy, because what are we doing? We're getting the, the, the person, the guy, who was responsible in our minds as well, and bunging him on the bonfire. They're not doing that here for Haman. There's no, let's get an effigy of Haman and do it. No, 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 it's a, let's feast and celebrate God's goodness, and let's do good to others. Do you see the difference, the marked contrast? It's not the, let's think about the baddie. It's, let's celebrate the goodness and let that allow us to bless others so that they too can join in our feasting and celebration. You see, God's people are to be characterised by, by love, not <laughs> hatred. So their remembrance isn't that sense of the absolute hatred. It's a, it's a remembrance of joy. We'll come to it in a moment, but we're, we're going to share bread and wine together. We don't remember and hate on the Romans as we share bread and wine together. Oh, they nailed Jesus to the cross. No, we... We celebrate and give thanks for Jesus, our Saviour, and his blood shed for us. Well, back in Esther chapter 9, verse 23, reminds us that it's, it's called Purim because of Haman cast the lot on that day. Verse 23, the, the Jews agreed to continue the celebration as they've been doing for Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, enemy of the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pur, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. Verse 26, therefore these days were called Purim, or from the word pure, because of everything written in this letter, and because of what they'd seen and what had happened to them. The Jews took it upon themselves to establish a custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. So they call it Purim because that's the time when he, he rolled the dice but God was in control. It, the lot was drawn. So they take that name to remind themselves that look, God's even in control of the, the, the casting of a lot, the rolling of a dice. It was the day that they were supposed to be annihilated, yet it ends up being the day they're rescued. In effect, calling it Purim, they're calling it Lottery Day. It's a lottery day. But God is in control even of the roll of a dice. That's how great our God is. So it's that joyful celebration going on. You can roll a dice against us, but if we've got God on our side, you haven't got a hope of standing, have you? And it's for all the people and all who should join them. This universal, annual, unceasing thanksgiving to God for his goodness and his grace. Isn't the word Purim just a great reminder for us that God is providentially in control of everything? That time when you go, well, why did that happen? That seemed to be for no reason or no purpose. And you go, well, what was the point of that? God's in control, even of the minute detail, as well as the big things. They're to celebrate this annually, so that they do not forget. And that's really important for God's people, and I think for God as well, because how quickly have they forgotten the rescue from Egypt? And you would have thought, if you've been rescued from Egypt with a Passover, oh, surely you're not going to forget, and yet so quickly they forgot. God's people have been re rescued in the most dramatic of ways, so they set up Purim to remember. You and I have been rescued in a more dramatic way because we were under the threat of death because of our sin and our separation from God. And yet God in his mercy sends Jesus, his son, to die on the cross, to shed his blood, to rise again, to one day return. We have been rescued in a dramatic way. But now we are free from despair and fear because through Jesus and his shed blood on the cross, we know salvation. That's why we're going to come and celebrate today as we share bread and wine. That's why we have celebration festivals. I guess 
our nearest equivalent to Purim is Christmas, isn't it? We celebrate the coming of the Deliverer Jesus, and we celebrate with joy and we give gifts. And there's joyful celebration and we think of others at that time as well. We do good. But we don't just celebrate at Christmas, Jesus is coming. We celebrate Easter, his, his death on the cross and his resurrection. But more than that, we, we once a month gather together to eat bread and drink wine. Those symbols, those reminders of his body given for us, his blood shed for us. But more than that, we meet together on a Sunday because Jesus is risen from the dead. The very fact you're here today is a celebration to say Jesus is alive. So week in, week out, as you look in your diary and you go, Sunday, I'm going to church. Why? Because I'm celebrating God's deliverance. And as we share bread and wine, you go, why? I'm celebrating God's deliverance. When you celebrate Easter uh, and you give Easter eggs because you've got to do something nice to others. Uh, and, and you just go, I'm celebrating with joy. When you celebrate Christmas, it's only six months. Apparently, there are some Christmas cards already on sale in some shops. It's only six months ago because you want to celebrate with joy. God has delivered. Do you see why we need Esther 9 and 10? We need to see and know that we celebrate God's deliverance with joy and feasting and thanksgiving. Isn't that why today you're going to have Sunday lunch? Because Sunday lunch, oh, it's like the... Sorry, it's the best meal of the week. It really is. It's like, oh, it's great. I, all the others are lovely as well. Uh, but, but, but Sunday lunch is so special, isn't it? And it's Sunday because it's the day Jesus rose from the dead. And this is a symbol. And I know you're not going to get fat on this, but it's going to be a, a joyful celebration. And even in the, the tiny bit of bread and the little sip of wine, I go, Jesus died for me. Praise God. And I'll do Christmas and I eat Easter and, and so many more. That's why we need Esther 9, uh, 9 and 10, to remind us that God's deliverance is completed and then it's celebrated. And it concludes then with this, this very last three verses. And again, you might go, oh, you should have finished at chapter 9. Well, what's the three verses of chapter 10 about? Well, the three verses of chapter 10 are about Mordecai, now second in rank, he's held in high esteem, he works for the good of his people, he speaks up for the welfare of the Jews. But you know what? Mordecai is going to die. And it leaves you longing for a greater, permanent leader who will be like this, looking out for the welfare of his people, honouring God, held in high esteem, speaking up. Mordecai gives you a, a foretaste, a picture of Jesus. There's one coming who will rule and reign forever in the way of Mordecai. So we don't want to end at chapter 9 because we just want those little breadcrumbs to go, oh, but look, the story must continue. And if you were reading through the Bible in chronological order and you got to Esther, you'd be like, what's next? What's next, a few hundred years later, is the coming of God's King, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we wrap up Esther, the real hero, as I hope you've seen throughout, it's not Queen Esther, it's not Cousin Mordecai, but it's God who's silent but sovereign, working to direct every event, working for his people's deliverance, for their good, for his glory. As you sort of review in your minds over this week, perhaps, the book of Esther, would you, like Esther, trust God, who's in complete control of all things? Complete control of things in your life, in the life of our nation, in the life of our world who's in complete control of everything. Trust him, who's silent but sovereign. Let's pray together before we come and share bread and wine. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace in delivering us. May we, as we share this bread and wine in a moment, rejoice in your love for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd like us to go straight into sharing this bread and wine together this morning and we'll sing uh, at the close of our service. It's wonderful, isn't it? That on the Lord's Day, on Resurrection Day, we eat bread and we drink wine in remembrance that Christ has died for us. I'd like to read to you, in the light of what we've just seen in Esther, some words from the book of Romans and chapter 5. If you've got a Bible, please turn to Romans chapter 5. Because we've been thinking about God's 
sovereignty over all things. And we read in uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, <clears throat> Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And as we come to share bread and wine together this morning, we're reminded that Christ has died for us sinners, but we come with joyful, thankful hearts that our sins are forgiven and that in Christ we now have peace with God. Let me lead us in prayer before we share this bread and this wine together. Father, thank you that you acted at just the right time. We've seen that in the book of Esther. Your timing has been perfect. <clears throat> Lord, your timing is always perfect. And when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Father, thank you for this demonstration of your love for us. That while we were still sinners and rebellious against you, while we still rejected you and turned our faces away from you, you were running towards us in love, <clears throat> with mercy and grace and compassion, Thank you, Father, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us on the cross. Thank you, Father, that you have awakened us to the joy of your salvation. Thank you, Father, that you have set your spirit in our hearts. Thank you that you poured out your love upon us, your people. Father, we're unworthy. We have sinned against you in thought and in word and in deed, and for that, Lord, we are heartily sorry. Forgive us our sins, we pray. Lord, help us this day to celebrate and rejoice with feasting and gladness the salvation we have in Jesus Christ, the peace we have with you through the Lord Jesus, the spirit that you have poured out into our hearts. Father, thank you that you're a God of grace. Thank you that you're a God who has delivered us. Help us to eat this bread and drink this wine with thankful, grateful hearts for all that you are and all that you've done for us. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. 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 The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we take and eat this bread this morning, take and eat it as it's passed around. Eat it with a thankful heart that Christ has died for you.
the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, God's people in Esther celebrated together. We're going to hold on to the cup. We can celebrate and drink together once we've all been served. <coughs> Together we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. We were going to sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. Uh, the projector has decided it's had enough, and uh, so that's all right. We'll have tea and coffee instead in a moment. We're going to close with a prayer, and maybe you want to think of that song. Maybe you can look at it on YouTube. Hum it to yourself when you get home. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. Let's pray as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, share this meal together, a symbol of this uh, wonderful salvation we have, we're reminded of our brothers and sisters in Christ who can't join us today. Lord, we're thankful for them, our church family. We're thankful for the salvation they too share with us. And as we think about this, even the, the string going round on the floor, we think of the, the shortness of life in comparison to the glories and riches of eternity. Lord, we long for that day till you call us home or come again. Until that day, would you hold us fast? Lord Jesus, for those who are struggling and unable to be here because of trials they're facing, hold them fast. May they know your love and your grace this day. For us too, Father, send us out with rejoicing and thanksgiving, with grateful hearts for all that you've done. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Well, please do stay uh, for tea and coffee. It will be served in a moment at the back of the